All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to one of our webinars that uh, the Woodlands Maker Station is putting on this winter. Um, our webinar today is called A Winter Wonderland, Birds in Your Backyard. Um, and I'm really happy that you're all here. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the U.S. Forest Service and the Friends of Land Between the Lakes, as well as all of us here at the Nature Station. My name is Marissa. I'm a naturalist here at the Nature Station. Um, I am fairly new. If you've been to some of our webinars, if you're quite familiar with us at the Nature Station, you may not have seen my face yet. Um, I am fairly new, as I said. I joined the team in September, and I'm more than happy to be a part of this team. It's been amazing uh, so far. Um, so hopefully you'll be seeing a lot more of me. Um, also on this webinar call, we do have two of our other naturalists at the Nature Station. We have Shannon and Monica. Um, so they are both here with us and they're going to be helping me out with this webinar, um, answering any questions uh, or comments in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so just know you can also talk to them about anything. Um, and now I would like to just give a couple basics about how this webinar is going to work. Um, I know by now at this point we're all pretty familiar with Zoom, um, but I, I'm going to go through it just again. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page and show you some of the functions that can help you out through this webinar. So the first function is the raise hands function. Um, so I might ask you some questions during our webinar and if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should have a raise hand little icon. So if you all would like to practice that right now and click that and raise your hand, that would just help me know we are all on the same page. And then you can also lower your hands um, or I can lower them for you. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. That's kind of a fun way we can all participate. Um, another function that's in Zoom is the Q&A. Uh, so you'll see that as a Q&A option down in that bottom taskbar again. Um, that is a place you can put questions throughout the webinar. Um, I'll leave uh, time throughout the webinar to be able to address or answer those. Um, Shannon and Monica can also help with that. Um, and then that last function is the chat function, um, which I see some of you have already been using. Um, our naturalists have said hi to in that. Um, so feel free to use that for any questions and comments as well throughout the presentation. Um, so I would like to go ahead and get started um, talking about some backyard birds. Um, so just as a basic question, would you raise your hand for me if you are pretty familiar with backyard birds? So I can gauge kind of, yeah, good amount. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Um, so it looks like a good amount of people are familiar with backyard birds. I am going to go over some of the identification basics um, just to make sure it's kind of a level playing field for us as we move forward and talking about how to make your backyard the perfect winter wonderland for these friendly feathered friends that we want to come to our backyard. Okay. Um, so I have some of our most common backyard birds on this slide. Um, so the first is one of my favorites. I actually have little earrings of them on right now, um, is the Carolina chickadee. Um, so these are ones that are super common to find in your backyard. They come in large blocks. They're really small, um, a nice light gray color. They have that really cute black head. Um, and they're definitely one of the ones that are gonna to wanna to come to your beautiful buffet of bird seed and bird food. Um, very common. Um, the next is the Northern Cardinal. Uh, these guys are also very common, one that you probably are very familiar with. They're a bigger bird. Um, the males are bright red and have that really nice thick beak. Um, the females are brown and have some sort of tingy orange red on the ends of their wings. A really beautiful bird um, and pretty easy to, to find and to attract to your backyard. They may already be there um, or you may want to entice them to show up, but they're pretty easy sellout for uh, many types of food as we'll get to. And then that one all the way over here, um, that is our American goldfinch. Um, I would like to note this is their summer plumage. So this is the way they look in the summer. Very bright, bright, cheery, beautiful yellow um, with those really nice dark, dark pitch black wings and those bright white stripes. 
Um, very easy to identify in the summer. Um, in winter, their plumage, their feathers change a little bit. They take on a more muted color. Um, so it's a little bit more muted and gray. They still have quite a bit of um, yellow around their face, but it's definitely a dimmer yellow. Uh, and I have a picture later on um, of uh, American goldfinches in their winter plumage, so you can kind of gauge, okay, that's what that looks like, and that's what I'll actually see in my backyard this time of year. Um, and then I have a few more. Um, so this guy over here is called an Eastern, oops, too many clicks, Eastern Toki, all the way on the left. Um, so they're one that's pretty common. Um, they require some specific feeding methods, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Um, but they are very common and do are more than present here in Western Kentucky. Um, and definitely one that you could be seeing in your backyard. Uh, and they're most identifiable by that dark kind of black brown back. And then they have a white and red breast um, that kind of um, separated like that, white on the inside, red on the sides. And then we have our tufted titmouse. Um, so our, this picture is a tad misleading because um, you can't really see his usual tuft on top of his head. Um, it must just be the way he's positioned in the photo. Um, but they are uh, super common, much like the chickadee. Um, they come in big flocks and you can find them everywhere. Um, we certainly have lots at the nature station, which is really wonderful because I think they're really fun to watch as a backyard bird. Um, they do have that nice gray back and they do have a little bit of that warm brown if you can see right underneath the wing. Um, so that's kind of the best way to identify them along with that tuft on their head. Um, and then over, uh, you over to the right more, you have the downy woodpecker. Um, those are the most common woodpecker we're going to find in Kentucky um, and in most of the United States, definitely on the eastern side. Um, they're a smaller woodpecker um, and they are ones that are very likely to come to bird feeders, specific suet, specifically suet feeders, um, which I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, but they're one that's definitely going to be attracted by the food that you put out, which is really wonderful because they're really fun to see. Um, and a really beautiful bird. They have, like I said, that little bit of red on the top of their head, um, and then those really beautiful wings uh, with, that are black and kind of have those white dots along them horizontally. And then another very common woodpecker that you might see in your backyard is the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, so the name is a little bit of a misnomer. It doesn't have a red belly, um, and they're often confused with red-headed woodpeckers. However, the red belly, the one I have the picture of here, uh, is much more likely to visit your backyard given the right circumstances. Um, and they're best identified by kind of that red mohawk, I like to say, on their head. Um, so you can kind of see, they don't have a completely red head. The red-headed woodpecker does have a completely red head. So if you see the red around their eyes and going all the way around, that's a red-headed. But if they just have that nice punk mohawk, then it's a red-bellied. Um, they also have a really bright white breast, um, and you can often find them in pairs of two kind of chittering. Um, so those are also quite common. Okay, so what makes a backyard a winter wonderland? Um, so on this slide, I have the three things that make a habitat because really what you want to do to attract birds to your backyard is make a really wonderful habitat for them. So the first and arguably most important is a food source. Um, these birds choose to stay here during winter. They don't choose to fly south like many other species of birds. So it's really important for them to have a stable and sustainable source of food. And lately, in the last couple of decades, as bird feeders and bird feeding has become much more popular, they have it in loads, which is really wonderful. And I'm guessing we're all in the same boat here of we all love feeding our backyard birds. Um, so they can live here during the winter when it's a lot colder. Um, we might get some freezing rain, maybe some snow, um, maybe only a little bit of snow. I'm from Michigan, so I'm used to seeing a lot of snow. but. I'm learning here in Kentucky, it's only a little. 
So um, we want to make sure that we put out the right kind of food and the kind of food that's going to be the best for them. High fat content, high nutrient content. Another thing that's really important for them is a water source. Um, so we think about in summer having all of these beautiful bird baths, metal, maybe they hang, they're engraved, but lovely, very aesthetic. Um, however, they still need some source of water in the winter. Um, and that can very well come from bird baths that you put out. However, there are a couple tips, tips and tricks I want to give you um, because we do get below freezing here. Uh, and when a bird bath is full of water and that water freezes into an ice hard block, it's not super great for the birds. Sitting on a block of ice isn't going to do them much for as, you know, as far as intaking water into their bodies um, or being able to bathe in it. Um, so if you are in the market for um, a bird bath to kind of provide some water in your backyard for your birds, one thing I would look for is a drip bird feeder. Um, so it has a drip function where it cycles water through um, and that prevents the surface of the water from freezing, preventing a whole block of ice from forming. Um, so if you can find a bird a bird bath um, that has a drip that's really wonderful in a way to kind of keep that water moving um, and keep it from freezing. Uh, and those are really easy to find places like Lowe's and Menards, um, Birds Unlimited, things like that. They do carry drip bird baths or bird baths with drips. Another thing I might look for is um, a heated bird bath. Um, so when I was doing this webinar, my boss joked, okay, you don't want to make a bird hot tub, which is true, that would not be good for the birds. Um, but if you do have a bird bath with some sort of small heating element, that can also serve the same function of preventing that water from freezing, um, which is really important. So those are the two things I would look for if you're in the market for a bird bath, a drip, um, a drip bird bath, and then one with a heating element or both if you can find that, um, and both are fairly easy to find and fairly inexpensive. Um, and then the third thing you need for a habitat is shelter. Um, so birds do need shelter, and especially in the winter. Um, you have these big, strong winds going, and it gets cold. Um, so for that reason, putting your bird feeders near some sort of shelter is really helpful for the birds. Um, it allows them a short kind of commute distance to get food to where they can kind of rest, relax, and conserve their heat and body energy. Um, so shelter, like I said, could be a tree line. It could be a big built-up garden, um, some bushes. It could be near your deck if that can act as a shelter. Anything that provides them some place they can go to where they're out of the wind and can, you know, conserve their body heat a little bit. And I'll touch on this later as well, but Something else to think of for shelter is there are predators in your backyard, um, or there may be predators. Um, so providing shelter to get away from predators uh, is also important for making sure your backyard birds can stay nice and safe and happy. Um, and while we're on this slide, I would like to touch on um, this picture. I love this picture, it's really beautiful. This was taken at the nature station um, in winter, obviously. Um, and the birds on the right, one kind of in the middle there, those are your goldfinch in winter. So you can see the plumage is much more muted. Um, they do still have some yellow on their head and face, um, but it's definitely more muted. But they do still have those wings with those really strong, nice stripes. Um, and then also, if you see that really nice looking pink bird right there, that is a, definitely an honorable mention of a backyard bird. That is a purple finch. Um, so we do have purple finches here. We also have house finches, and they look very similar, both backyard birds. Um, so if you have some birds that look sort of like that visiting your backyard, um, they're most identifiable by that pink color. Um, purple finches are going to be quite a bit more purpley, more red, more pink, um, whereas house finches look very, very similar in size. In almost in coloration, they're a little less purpley. Um, the purple or red is most concentrated around their neck and head. So if you see that his, um, his purple kind of goes down his breast, that's a good indication that he is a purple. And I do see I have a question up here, maybe. Oh, it got answered. Never mind. Um, so I will keep moving here. 
Okay, food types. So we have quite a few different food types that we can offer our backyard birds. Um, I've done some of my own fancy market research um, and I'm going to give you the recommendations of what I found to be the best bang for your buck, the most affordable, um, and what the birds prefer um, because birds are picky just like humans. Um, we think of them as birds but they have food preferences just like we do. So the first one there, black oil sunflower seed, is that top right image. Um, it doesn't look like a whole lot of something special, um, but that is through and through the favorite bird seed of your backyard birds. Um, no one really discriminates against it. It's a, everyone's kind of a fan of it. Um, there are a lot of seed mixes like that one in the bottom right corner that include black oil sunflower seed. You can see some of them in there. Um, and a lot of people swear by their seed blends. It's completely up to you. It's your decision, it's your choice. Um, however, I found um, that seed blends tended to be more expensive. Um, and then also um, through what I've witnessed uh, and then through some research as well, birds tend to pick through it for the stuff they like, um, which tends to be the black oil sunflower seed. Um, kind of like when I eat trail mix, I just pick out the M&Ms and throw out the raisins and maybe I'll eat a peanut, but everything else doesn't really matter. It's just for the M&Ms. And birds are kind of the same way where they're really going for that black oil sunflower seed. Um, a couple other food types um, are suet. That's the top left picture. Um, so that's a suet cake. Uh, it's a cake that has several different types of seed in it. And those are really wonderful at attracting woodpeckers to your backyard. There are other birds that really enjoy them. Um, chickadees enjoy them, tufted titmouse. Um, but if you're looking to attract woodpeckers to your backyard, you really want to go with a suet cake. And that will go in a suet cage or a suet feeder, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, the last food is something I learned about during my research, whole peanuts. Um, so whole peanuts are a very popular a food item for certain types of birds, depending on what you're looking to attract. Um, so one of the favorites, um, or one of the birds that favors peanuts are blue jays. So if you think blue jays are really beautiful and you want to have them in your backyard, you may want to uh, look into getting some peanuts, getting a peanut feeder, which we'll talk about, um, and offering them that. Um, other birds that like peanuts would be grackles, if you're a fan of saying something like that, um, crows, um, several other types of birds. It's also a really great food for squirrels, which um, I'll touch on. Um, quick raise of hands using our raise hand button. Uh, does anybody love squirrels in their backyard? I got two people to four people? Wow, five, six. That's a lot more than I thought. <laughs> um, okay, I'll lower those. Does anyone not like squirrels in their backyard? Raise your hand. Okay, those numbers went up a lot quicker. I, I got a couple for the like squirrels. I got a lot more and a lot faster for the don't like squirrels. <laughs> um, so uh, squirrels are something that we kind of battle as backyard bird enthusiasts. Um, I'll talk about them in a little bit, but one of the things I'll suggest is offering squirrels an alternative. And peanuts are a really great alternative for squirrels that are really delicious um, and kind of save some of your bird seed for your birds. All right. Okay, so feeder types. So we talked about food types now. Um, and now I'd like to talk about feeder types because those foods go in different feeders. Um, so the seed blends and the black oil sunflower seed um, would go in your tube feeder, so that lower right picture. Um, that is the most common type of feeder. Uh, it's pretty usual to see. They're pretty cheap and affordable um, and easy to maintain. Um, so that's definitely something I would recommend. Um, a lot of things can fit in it, can go in it, and a lot of birds really enjoy feeding from it. Um, however, birds feed differently. So the birds that are going to visit your tube feeders are usually smaller birds that can perch on those, you know, nice perches that they're built into it. Um, 
If it's a larger bird, that may not be the best option for them. They may have a hard time landing on that tiny perch and being able to maintain balance while feeding. Um, so another option that you have is a platform feeder, which is that top uh, left photo uh, with a really cute thickety on it. Um, platform feeders offer a little bit more surface area um, to be able to land on. Um, so I have seen things like cardinals land on tube feeders, um, but they might be much more likely to land on platform feeders. Um, it provides a nice space for them to, you know, have a nice steady ground to feed on. Um, and those work very similar to tube feeders where you pop up the top, pour your seed in, and then it spills out through the holes in the bottom. Um, so that's something I would also recommend uh, depending on what kind of birds you're looking to attract. This top right photo is an example of a suet cage or a suet feeder. Um, so there's a nice block of suet in there um, that that pileated woodpecker is feeding on. Um, this is kind of a unique photo to me because I haven't heard about a lot of success in attracting pileated woodpeckers to bird feeders. Um, they typically prefer to drill into dead trees and look for things like bugs or insects. Um, but uh, this person was very lucky and attracted one. Um, definitely uh, your downy woodpeckers, uh, like I said, um, red-bellied, things like tufted titmouse and chickadees will love suet feeders. Um, and a little tip I learned through working at the nature station is um, if you freeze your suet cakes, it makes for really easy removal. Um, I know growing up, my dad kept ours just out on the counter at room temperature and they were always really greasy. Uh, so I'd cut into it and go and put it in the feeder, but my hands would feel really gross afterwards. Um, so if you put your suet cakes in the freezer and just keep them there until you're ready to use them, it's really easy to just cut them out, pop them out and put them in the feeder and let them thaw outside. Um, so that is a tip I would recommend for that. Easy cleanup. Um, and then lastly, that bottom left corner uh, is your whole peanut feeder. Um, so that is what you would put whole peanuts in. There are a couple different shapes and forms of them, um, but this is the most common. It's a ring, um, and then you can kind of put peanuts in at the top, and they kind of fall down to the center and fill up the ring. Um, so there's a nice picture of a chickadee on that one as well. Um, they're clearly very non-discriminatory feeders. Um, but that's really great, again, for grackles, blue jays, um, squirrels, some smaller birds. Um, the smaller birds will most likely peck at the peanut shells until the peanuts fall out. Um, but some of the other bigger birds might actually use their beak to wiggle the whole peanut out and then crack into it that way. Um, and as a naturalist who uh, helps take care of our animals at the Woodlands Nature Station, um, we think about enrichment a lot, uh, different ways to enrich the lives of our animals, um, different brain teasers and puzzles for them to kind of spice up their day. Uh, and this is actually a really great form of enrichment for birds or squirrels. Um, it's kind of not as easy as landing on a nice perch and just pecking out the seed. You got to work for it a little bit. Um, so if you're a wildlife photographer or looking for a little backyard entertainment, this can actually be something that's really fun to um, watch and kind of be a part of. Um, so that's something I would recommend if you're looking to expand your horizons and try something new in your backyard. Uh, and then my last bullet point there just says ground. Um, so a lot of our birds do land on feeders. However, a lot of backyard birds are um, actually what we call ground feeders, which means they don't feed from a, your typical feeder. Um, they prefer to get their food off of the ground. Um, so that eastern tohi that was on my second slide is a great example of a ground feeder. Um, they are ones that prefer to just get their seed, like I said, off of the ground, pick through the grass. Um, so if you're looking to attract birds that are ground feeders, you may actually want to put your bird seed or whatever food you're offering right on the ground, which sounds a little weird, um, but it actually would attract things like that. I know I was looking through some forums and some other people wanted to attract something like wild turkeys. If you're interested in seeing that in your backyard, and that's another great ground feeder. Um, so if you were looking for wild turkeys, you might sprinkle some cracked corn, um, some corn pieces on the ground, and that would be a great um, incentivizer for the wild turkey.
So it kind of depends on what birds you're looking for um, and what you want to offer them. Um, I have a resource I'll show you, and that's really great for kind of figuring that out. Um, at this point, I kind of want to pause for a second and see if anyone has any questions about other types of feeder, um, other types of bird food or bird seed, um, to see if I can answer any questions for you. So if you do have a question, feel free to type it in the Q&A now. I'll give you a minute, um, and then I'll answer any questions we have. And if not, I'll... oh, okay. Great question. Okay, so someone asked, what about fruits or berries? That is a really wonderful question. Um, so fruits and berries are really great. They're found naturally in um, the summertime, in spring, summer, and fall when berries are kind of blooming um, and birds most definitely love winter it may be hard to provide the right type um, so what I would most recommend doing is that save your thought for the springtime and do some research as to what friendly um, bird berries you can plant in your yard um, that are native native landscaping is a really wonderful way to also get those backyard birds um, into your backyard and kind of entice them um, at the nature station, one of our most popular bushes that birds like to visit is our American Beautyberry. It's a really beautiful bush uh, that has these bright purple berries. Um, really pretty, um, fairly large and sprawling, but it would be really beautiful in a corner of someone's backyard. Um, so that's something I would recommend um, is waiting till spring and looking up what native flowering and berry plants you could plant in your backyard to attract those birds. Um, and then hummingbirds is a whole nother conversation of a backyard bird for summer, but um, you can also look into what kind of plants are native that would also be wonderful for um, um, Is a heated dog bowl okay or does it make the water too warm? Um, I think that would be okay to work as a bird bath as long as the water uh, is lukewarm as long as you don't stick your finger in it and it's very hot then it would probably be okay for them um, the main purpose of it is just to make sure it doesn't freeze so as long as you're not creating that little bird bath hot tub um, like I mentioned it, it would probably be okay um, I did not mention the black niger seed for finches um, that was something I came across in my research um, but it's, it's sometimes recommended. I found it to be a little expensive um, compared to the black oil sunflower seed, uh, which can be bought. Um, I think we get ours, um, we get about a 10 to 15 pound bag for about $10. So it's really affordable and it lasts a really long time. Okay, I am going to keep moving here. Um, all right. Okay, so I definitely wanted to touch on this as well. Um, maintenance and concerns um, for our bird, backyard birds, our feeders, everything that is encompassed within that. Um, so the first thing I'd like to mention is frequent cleaning of bird feeders. Um, so birds actually spread diseases, just like we humans do. What a time to talk about this, right? Um, but one of the things that they spread is called conjunctivitis. In humans, this is basically pink eye, um, but birds can get it and can spread it among themselves as well. Um, and because they are such tiny organisms, they usually die from it. And it's spread through communal feeding places, like bird feeders, it's a really great that's spot, unfortunately, for conjunctivitis. Um, so one of the things we do at the Nature Station and that we recommend others do is we switch out our bird feeders every few weeks and we clean them and we let them sit. So um, I would recommend every couple of weeks taking down your tube feeder or whatever you have, cleaning it with a mild bleach solution, um, and then rinsing it off, making sure all the solution is off, 
and letting it sit and dry um, in your garage or somewhere else that's kind of a safe place um, to make sure everything that could be possibly contaminated is off of it. And to make sure you're not, you know, a part of this problem of these birds unfortunately spreading this disease. Um, so that's something we do. Um, it's really helpful in this situation to have a couple of different um, bird feeders for that very purpose, to have one that can sit in the garage unused, just to be used later when you go and clean the other one. Okay, another one is predators. So I talked earlier about the importance of shelter. Um, shelter is really important, like I said, for those cold winter winds, um, but also for predators. So can I see a quick raise of hands if anyone uh, recognizes this bird? Yeah, I know I wrote its name on the slide. However, um, many of you have may have seen this bird um, or definitely heard of it. It is called a Cooper's hawk. Um, it's a smaller species of hawk. Um, and interestingly enough, it actually used to migrate south because its food source um, wasn't sustainable enough in winter in this region. However, um, it actually does not migrate anymore. It stopped, um, or it's gradually stopped and slowed over the last few decades because we humans have supplied it with a really wonderful food source, all of our backyard birds that congregate at our nice buffet of bird seed, um, which means that they all of a sudden have a really wonderful source of food ready to go whenever they want in a location that they're aware of. So if you see Cooper's hawks in your backyard, you're actually doing a really wonderful A plus job because you have created a food chain in your backyard. You have created your own little ecosystem that is so stable, it has actually introduced predators into it. So great job, round of applause for you. However, if you're not such a fan of Cooper's hawks or of your nice backyard birds being picked off, um, then putting your bird feeders close to a, some sort of shelter is even more important. Um, so if you are able to put your feeders somewhere near a tree line that gives those birds shelter they can fly to to escape, that's really helpful. Um, that, can, that can definitely um, make them a little bit safer in this situation. Um, it is a really neat thing. I personally love birds of prey and hawks. I think they're really cool and amazing. Um, however, I also like seeing uh, the chickadees and the tufted titmouse um, that they would really love to go after and make a really nice meal. All right, and then my last bullet point on there is squirrel proofing and alternatives. Um, so many people um, have different beliefs about squirrel proofing feeders. Um, some people swear by their squirrel proof feeders that are $150 on Amazon. Um, they can get quite expensive. Um, there are some that do have really great reviews. Something I would recommend is that if you are in the market for a squirrel proof feeder, um, look for one, they're typically tube feeders. Um, look for one that has metal around those openings that the seed comes out of because most often what squirrels do is they'll jump onto the feeder and they will use their really really nice long teeth that are very strong um, and chew through that plastic to make the hole bigger so that more seed spills out onto the ground where they can eat it. Um, so if you have a tube feeder that has metal around those holes that's uh, really helpful in preventing them from chewing through the plastic. Um, so that could be kind of a neat tip um, if you are wanting to keep squirrels away from your bird seed. Um, another one that I mentioned is providing them an alternative. That's what we do at the nature station. We offer them places where they can come and eat. Um, of course, we uh, at the nature station love all wildlife and want to support it. Um, so we don't mind our squirrels. We have a very healthy squirrel population and they're part of what helps uh, Land Between the Lakes grow all of our amazing trees. Um, when they bury their nuts and forget about them. However, if you are looking to uh, feed them, kind of distract them away from your bird seed, things like peanuts can be a really wonderful distraction for them. Uh, I've never met a squirrel that doesn't love a peanut. Um, so if you are looking for that, that is what I would recommend. Um, and just learn to love them. 
my boss, when I started researching this um, webinar, he said there's only one thing you can do against squirrels in the battle against squirrels, and it was lose, because we most likely will lose. Um, but they live here too, um, so it's up to you as to how you would like to deal with them. Um, all right. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Um, I have kind of gone through my information there, but I'd love to answer any questions about other maintenance or concern items you may have about bird feeding or bird feeders um, or any questions along those lines. So I'll open it up right now on the floor uh, and answer any questions you may have. Pull up my Q&A here. I'll give you a few minutes to type things out. Okay. Where is the best place to put a feeder close to the house? Um, so I would say if you do have a deck, put it somewhere near a deck um, that provides a space where maybe birds can fly under if you have some sort of trellis under it. Um, or if there's any posts under it that they can seek shelter. Um, like I said, somewhere they can conserve their body heat uh, or escape from predators. So if you were looking to put bird feeders close to the house where you can see them, um, the best thing you could do would probably be put them near a deck, yeah. Unless you have any larger bushes. Um, at my house, we have a really nice built up garden area where we put our bird feeders that also provide shelter. Uh, and a wind block. If you also are fancy enough to figure out the direction of the wind and where it usually comes, um, you can also kind of finagle your bird feeders to be out of the strongest, most likely path of the wind. Okay, what about cats? Um, so cats are a, another predator to backyard birds and birds in general. Um, the best thing I could say is if you do have the option, um, keep your cats as indoor cats. Uh, there's been a lot of research done um, that kind of promotes keeping indoor cats versus outdoor cats. Because cats are great hunters and they do affect um, the backyard bird population a little bit um, by doing what they do best, which is hunt. Okay, what do you use to clean your bird bath? That's a great question. Um, so bird baths as well, just like bird feeders, could be an area where conjunctivitis would spread. Um, so I would clean them the same way as I would clean the bird feeders. Um, with a mild bleach solution, make sure you rinse it, get all of it off, let it sit, disinfect, and then be able to use it again. Any suggestions on keeping the neighbor's cat from hunting birds under the feeder? That's a really hard one if it's not your cats, um, unfortunately. So I would most recommend maybe putting your bird feeders in an area that you think is safest from a cat um, or a cat wouldn't have access to. So maybe it's on the other side of the lawn if it doesn't stray that far um, or talking with your neighbor. Okay. How do I control large unwanted flocks of cowbirds, rackles, etc.? Um, you can try and find a seed that they're not a fan of. Um, however, I know both are generalists, so they do like eating a lot of different varieties of seeds. Um, so it's really difficult, it's kind of like you offer the best buffet and it's gonna attract the whole crowd. Um, so I would most recommend um, researching any seeds and seeing if there's any that they're not the biggest fan of uh, and then offering those. Okay, this is a great question. What about dried mealworms? I thought bluebirds liked them, but my birds pick around them. Uh, they seem to like holly berries instead. Birds are most definitely a fan of holly berries. We have a beautiful deciduous holly in the back of our, um, in, the, in our backyard at the Woodlands Nature Station. And that's a popular favorite for some really, really pretty birds like um, waxwing crescents and bluebirds. Um, Typically, dried mealworms are recommended for attracting bluebirds. So maybe you just have some picky bluebirds, but I would think you're doing all the right things because um, that is the food that they tend to really enjoy. 
All right, so my last slide here is a resource that I want to share with you guys and show you how to use. Um, so I have this link here. Uh, it's through something called Project Feeder Watch, which is a citizen science project um, that was created. Um, and it basically is this big community of people all over the US um, that watch their backyard birds and submit info into this big system that's then used by researchers and scientists. Um, things like what birds are coming to your backyard under which circumstances, which seed are you offering? Um, and it's a really great source of information and a great way to find community. So this research was, or this resource was provided through them. Um, and I would like to show you now how to use it. We will be sending a follow-up email after this webinar, uh, and this link will be in it so you have it to use. All right. So when you put in the link, this is what is going to show up on your web browser. Um, so it's a really pre beautiful, pretty graphic. Um, we have some bluebirds on there, some both memorials. Um, so what you're going to want to do is click the red button, view bird list. And then we have um, some different options here. Um, so I am going to do um, where I'm at. So you can use these filters over on the left hand side to lower it to narrow down what region of the US you are. We're in the southeast. And then I am going to select black oil sunflower seed because that's what I've recommended. Um, and then we'll do a large tube feeder. So using this resource, if I were to offer a black oil sunflower seed and a large tube feeder, and I'm in Kentucky, these are the birds I might have visiting my backyard. So we have goldfinch, like I talked about, cardinal, some other ones are purple finch. Um, another honorable mention would be the red-breasted nuthatch and the white-breasted nuthatch. Um, and you can actually click on these birds. So let's go with the white-breasted nuthatch and see where they are. So in the winter, they're in the northeast, southeast, southwest, and northwest. Very generalist, can live pretty much everywhere. And look at all the food they eat. They are not very picky at all. And they also will feed from a large, um, a large option of food choices and food mechanisms, your food feeders. Um, so now let's try something else. Go back. Not all the way back. There we go. Okay, so let's go. Let's try the southeast again. And let's do millworms, like someone mentioned. Okay. And then we'll go all feeder types. Um, so these are then what you might have if you offered mealworms. One of those that people are really interested in attracting to their backyard is eastern bluebirds because they're beautiful. They make my day better every time I see them. Um, just that bright flash of blue. So if you scroll down on the eastern bluebird, you can tell exactly where they are. So in the winter months, like we're entering now, they are found in the southeast in places like Kentucky. And then they also are attracted to suet, peanut hearts, fruit, and mealworms. So they're really great ones. So you are doing the exact right thing by offering mealworms. Maybe they just weren't in the mood. Um, and also they're another example, just like the Eastern Tohi of ground feeders. Um, another option for platforms that I know my family has used is we haven't used exact platform feeders. We've kind of makeshifted platform feeders. So we actually had dry mealworms and I just sprinkled them along our deck rail. And that actually worked really wonderfully for attracting bluebirds. Um, or if you're looking for things like Baltimore Orioles who also really love fruit, um, just cutting orange slices and placing them out on your deck in a safe area is also a great option. Um, that kind of works as a pseudo platform feeder. So I found this to be a really great resource. Again, you'll have this link in that follow-up email. Um, but if you're looking to attract a certain type of bird or you're curious as to um, what kind of bird you might be attracting if you put out this certain type of food in this certain way, in a certain feeder, it's a really neat way to be able to kind of predict and see what you might expect 
in your backyard. All right. So that is what I have for you today. I would love to answer any more questions you have, um, maybe about that resource um, or whatever you might have. Um, now, if you have any last minute questions. I also, while you're typing, I would like to mention, we are doing a few more webinars throughout this winter on some really interesting topics. Um, so I would recommend following our Facebook page um, and seeing if there are any more this winter that might interest you. Um, I know it's a really wonderful way to kind of get involved in the community, maybe learn some new things um, and get inspired to go outside. All right, thank you so much everyone for joining in. I don't think we have any more questions, um, but thank you again um, on behalf of the Forest Service and Friends of Land Between the Lakes and all of us here at the Woodlands Nature Station. We hope you have a great rest of your day um, and thank you so much for being a part of our presentation today.